So we like to talk about as isolation, like you mentioned, and then um, we like to talk about integration. I think there's like a conflict of interest because anything now moving towards like a federation, like a Sandra two frameworks, and you see that online uh, in the credentials and you know Kerberos. If you look at the Kerberos, it's a it's a great concept. Ultimately, it's a great concept how quickly you can authenticate the services. Uh, of course, it has its uh, security challenges like all the tickets and what you saw here and passing basically the tokens. So it's always a battle for uh, every company to create integration and at the same page create isolation. And uh, it creates, I would say, quite a bit of a business obstacle to, uh, to done it right. And uh, that at some point, what you see uh, various uh, enterprises doing is isolate just the critical systems and try to federate the rest. And uh, of, of course, it's probably not the ideal, but most likely, it doesn't look like anyone got it right on a complex scale. Now, some of you can think that the cloud is going to answer uh, that solution because in the cloud, it's also cloudy and controlled and super isolated. Um, federation is very native uh, among the cloud services, so it's almost like it's there for freebie, uh, the same way the Kerberos is free in AD. But I'm, I'm not really sure if uh, everyone can move into the completely to the cloud. Yeah. Yeah, if I can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so if I can summarize Sean's fantastic one hour presentation and also answer your question in one go, it's uh, don't let your users go to the internet, just take the web browser off, don't run Flash and uh, don't let them download attachments, any problem solved. Right? Obviously we can't do that, uh, so we need to figure out other ways to solve it. From a specific AD perspective, I think, I think we're in the era of IDSs, in that you're starting to see the rise of user behavior analytics, where we're getting visibility into the solutions, but what we're, starting to, what we're missing is policy and action that needs to follow. Because again, you know, we, can, we have, I'm sure you all have, uh, are being inundated with data, and UB just adds more data to it. Yeah, it identifies the users, but you need to be able to do something. So I think the policy and the action pieces are missing that. I think you missed WordPress in that list of <laughs> things that must be turned off. That's on their side. I'm just talking about what you <laughs> control, right? You can't control the internet. Uh, I think of it a little differently than isolating secure systems, uh, isolating complexity. Um, when you sit there, you take Active Directory, it's got a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of technology in it. And getting somebody to go, okay, I know what this is doing, there's a few people. We have 100 people that are masters from Microsoft. I, I can't get 100 people that understand Microsoft's Active Directory in my environment. So I want to isolate it off because their mistakes magnify across the entire environment. So it's understanding which systems have an amplification effect to their compromise or... Well, it's not just the amplification. It's the fact that nobody understands it or all of it or everything that's deployed. It's complicated. And complication means I want to keep it small and I want to keep it tight and I want to keep that complication in one space. How would you contain that? How do you manage that? Uh, that's the fun part. There's a lot of ways. Um, there's some new technology, uh, any way to try to abstract that, that interface between the desktops and the AD system. Steve? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, I got, uh, a critical business application, which is the source of it, that's one that our business requires. Let's just say if you're a bank, at the end of the day, you have to feed the Fed. Uh, that's a critical application. So therefore, anything that could impact that must also be a critical application. So if there is a security uh, system that could theoretically impact that, there, therefore, that must be critical. So I would say anything that a critical application is dependent upon is also critical. Or zero zero, as you're terming it. Then everything's critical. That's not true. How is it not? Everything's dependent on something. Well, they, if you don't want your critical business to go down, then that's so. Then yeah, those things are critical. Every, but Active Directory, IAM, is always critical. Everything's dependent on it. And, and depending upon how you structure your Active Directory, you, you can either isolate it or not, making sure that it stays up. Well, that's the within point. reason. Okay. So it's interesting that in the last hour, I think I've, if I can count, then a word that was most popular is isolation, over and over again. Um, the use case for us at Menlo is exactly that. I think Sean alluded to that, where you take the admin consoles, and this is a real life use case I've seen in a bank. Somebody with an admin privilege, right, is going to a Windows server, it's got Flash installed, they bring up IE and go to the internet. Okay, how wrong can that be? 
Uh, and then once, of course, anything is compromised at that point, it's game over, right? I mean, we've seen every, uh, the aftermath is what we heard about, but that simple use case of just having an admin console, just lock it down, isolate it, and whatever means you can, I mean, you're starting to eliminate threats. I think the end goal is really reduce attack surface in whatever way you can do that. So what we've seen in, uh, I would say, almost like 60 percent of the cases on our forensic work was that web applications that rely on AD authentication were being abused. And I hear what you're saying about malware, but I tell you over the last two, three years, we see actually decrease in the malware. If you look at the Samsung deployment of a ransomware right now, it's all going through Jables and Java. And what the attackers figure out is that, yes, the malware, you have advanced uh, heuristic detection, a lot of different elements. Ten lines of code in NSP create a Trojan in the code when you have 10,000 pages and literally can steal the AD credentials to be authenticated. And we had a big APT this year uh, with about Fortune 50, around 70 people uh, work on it. And it, that APT attack was literally through 10,000 servers embedded the code. Imagine tomorrow you're a developer to scan all the code over the last five years. Oh, no doubt, right? So if you think about the slammer vulnerability with the SQL, you know how big that was? That was, I think, 236 bytes. It could fit in one little packet. The latest Ransom32 ransomware is about 25 megabytes. Somewhere out there, somebody's running Jenkins and producing a pipeline of agile malware that just, they're just spinning up every week. They're running even scrums, right? Flash on Tuesday, Wednesday, let's release the malware. There's an entire agile process behind malware. So malware, at the end of the day, is just a piece of software. It's once it gets in, it's really, up, you know, today, I mean, or this year it's ransomware. Last year was Flash. The year before was Java, right? But once that piece of software comes to the endpoint, it could be an app you download from Google servers or an app server. It doesn't matter. It's just a piece of software. I think that's a statistic I remember seeing. Someone did an analysis of uh, the number of Docker containers mm -hmm. that were posted uh, on Docker or the number of uh, projects on GitHub that had some form of uh, malware or bad code inserted into them, and it was literally a high double-digit percentage. Yeah, ultimately, it's all around the code, right? I mean, it's a human talent engineering that created code, and it's a human talent engineering that actually hacks the code. And we all like to believe that uh, the uh, artificial intelligence with uh, all everything works together, but as you know from a Terminator, it somehow didn't work, right? It's punching the face and melts. So in reality, the code is hackable. It's all about the code. And once you get a code runtime in a memory, that's code, right? So more. If you right now a very good attacker, you shift from a malware and you go to code. Because when you compile a code on a web server in a memory of a computer, you want to trace it. So how do I prove that the software running on my infrastructure is mine and not yours? Well, that's a big consulting check. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can. OK, here's why. Uh, so 1987, Dr. Fred Cohen, he's the guy that actually coined the term computer virus. Uh, he actually published a seminal paper that said one piece of code can't look at another piece of code and tell you conclusively that it's good or bad. That's the same year McAfee announced her first antivirus. Okay? And the last 20 years, the, no coincidence, but you know, it's interesting. But the last 20 years, that's all we've been doing. We've been trying to figure this, you know, can I write more pieces of code that can figure out more pieces of software and see if it's good or bad? And then make a policy decision to whether allow it or block it, right? That game is not working. I, I tell you that that conversation starts with your IP attorney. Explain the adjective yours. I was just say I completely agree. One of the things we don't seem to do is understand the basics of what's going on in a computer. So you start adding in a virtualized environment on top of a hot browser. What happens when the DOM's zero? Do we know all the code that's being run there? How much of that? Um, last time I was at a company, the DOM zero was available to Corp Network. Oh, sure, it's SSH off, but it's, it's once again, we have this very basic infrastructure that is effectively running Active Directory and is an AD root. Yeah, I think, I think our biggest thing, at Menlo at least, the way we're thinking about it is we've been fighting one piece of bad code, malware or not, APT, ransomware, doesn't matter, right? I'm just bunching everything into bad code, let's just call it that. We've been trying to fight the war of identifying every single instance of every single bad code and trying to do something about it. I think we need to focus on the vectors, right? We need to think about where the, the channels through which the bad code comes in and remove those channels or secure those channels. Once you do that, it doesn't matter if the code is good or bad because that's never coming to the endpoint. 
that means that in Britain, in Bitcoins can be one of the secured channels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin no, comes in, it's exactly that Ethereum. one slide, I'm going to keep referring to that one slide, right? Bitcoin comes in because somebody opens a Word document from some random blog and said enable macros. You deserve to pay ransom. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of take think something back to the, the topic on the title up here. Is identity and access management the CISO's blind spot? And I'll tell you why we asked that question. Our company's product, one of the use cases, is Active Directory, um, hosting domain controllers and associated kit. The conversations I've had with the, the bigger the customer is, the less likely it is that this, the CISO seems to have any ownership or operational ownership of the Active Directory infrastructure. Yet AD seems to be the primary policy tool that's used in most enterprises because it locks down, at a minimum, users, files, machines, applications, and service accounts. Some of us have extended it to mobile devices and network devices and VPN users as well. And so I'm like, well, why doesn't the CISO own it? Well, it always seems to be that it, its management and administration grew out of the end user computing team. So end user computing, ran the desktops, they stood up the first instances of AD, and they're, they don't wanna, hey, that, that's our tool, boss. That, that's what we use to manage our infrastructure. And I, I was joking that it was like, you know, we're safe equals we're screwed. Because you know, the question from the CISO is, are, are we safe with AD or are we okay? Oh yeah, yeah, we're okay, boss. We got it, we're secure, we're fine. And when I see presentations like Sean's, I'm like, well, there's no way you're fine. <laughs> so, is it a blind spot for CISOs? Should the CISO have some operational control over identity and access management, or should they provide tighter governance over the team that is administering the IAM tools today? So if you think of a CISO role uh, today, it's, uh, you have a challenge to find your own identity around the four table and your own voice and find a budget for what you're trying to execute. So once you solve that, those problems, you can look at the identity management problems. And uh, I tell you, it's definitely not easy. Because even in Active Directory, what you mentioned, uh, you have LSAS, you have Mimikatz, you have memory dumps. Um, you have integration now with Azure. Um, and that looks promising. Looks like it's gonna eliminate some of the classical attack on AD infrastructure we've seen with the Kerberos and uh, past the hash type of attacks. On the same page, um, the combination of both is a killer. So for example, um, we had various laptops, uh, especially on uh, corporate espionage side, where an uh, attacker quickly figure out if the uh, computer with the malware is actually inside of the corporate environment or at the hotel or at the home space, right? And once it knows, just through a very simple HTTP deposit request, understands the IP address on that side, it starts exfiltrating the data. But the malware itself will never do anything inside the organization other than, for example, doing mapping requests with the AT Federation into the exchange mailbox and dumping the messages. Dumps everything to the computer, comes home, exfiltrate, securely deletes. Right, so is identity management an issue? Definitely an issue. I mean, um, you have a user who is authenticated and uh, his account is taking over and now how well can you monitor that account outside of the environment? Right, so cloud and Microsoft is shifting to Azure. They thinking they might be able to solve it, but those connectors do, do not exist because it still it doesn't connect as well after the backbone. It doesn't give you reporting that that's a user who now is authenticated as a GPO from the Azure. The same page is exfiltrating data. But another individual who took uh, 3,000 uh, files from cloud to a corporate network, transferred to his OneDrive. Right, same way, and now, you know, when you're working with law enforcement, there are very specific questions. Did he authenticate it to all those resources? That's kind of to Steve's point. Did, who has the access audit, right? Is, does, who has the access to do that? Do they have the is it Are they allowed to do that? Are they supposed to be allowed to do that? I mean, that's kind of the question you were bringing up earlier, Steve. Yeah. You know, you, you ask about the blind spot, and, and I would say... In a macro sense, I don't think it's a blind spot anymore. It may have been historically, but I think it's on everybody's map. I think everybody has seen enough hacking that, okay, credential theft is on the map. The problem is that, again, I'm going to go back to the surface area. This, the, the, the attack surface is so large that, okay, great, we're looking at Active Directory and we've got it locked down tight, but again, what about my mainframe? 
Mm -hmm. Or what about my AS400, where every single AS400 machine has its own authentication, right? And the CISO is not going to get into that level of detail. So I think what's happening is the blind spots are getting smaller and smaller, but you're getting to a level where they're more numerous. And you know, it's just a question of time. It's like pixels going out on an LCD. You can lose one or two, it's OK, but now there's little dots everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think the organizations have sort of evolved with the products that keep coming out, right? And so many of them are organized functionally. And Citrix, for example, you know, started off as an IT consolidation play. At some point, they called it isolation and said, let's go solve security problems with it, right? So until then, I, Citrix was an IT problem. At some point, it became a security problem. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is, and you know, I think somebody maybe earlier summarized that, organizations are organized functionally the where they're only seeing visibility for their own part. Attackers are looking at it very holistically. And so we're, we're missing things in the seams and cracks in the seams, which is where they're coming in. <clears throat> Yes, um, in the spirit of time, I have, I guess, a final question. I may, may sneak one in after this, but is there, a, I know the answer, but is there any silver bullet technology? And the answer will be no. But Wait, it, no, it, that's not true. <laughs> oh, no, it's my product, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is, it, uh, is there anything that's really interesting that's out or coming out that will make a material difference to enabling the people to have more effective processes to lock down their environments and prevent some of the breach types we're seeing make the headlines nowadays? I'm seeing a shift away from only saying no to trying to get to the point where we're changing the network, we're changing and modifying the environment so often that we're hoping to cause the attacker to behave differently. It's kind of a deception thing it's by not so being much fluid. The deception is, is as you move faster, let's say I change my 80, uh, 80 dev credentials. If I do that, he has got to regain that access. That act of regaining that access is something I have a chance of detecting again. So I didn't do it the first time, but if I do it three months later, I have another chance. Kind of more swings at the yeah, plate. Yeah, it's as, as things change, the more often they change, it's hard on you, it's also hard on them. So one of our customers um, is a CISO of a small organization, credit union, his name is Carl Kemp. And uh, he goes by Carl. All of the employees in the organization, they call him Don't Click Carl, because that's what he does every day. He's like going around telling people, don't click this, don't do this, don't open this attachment, don't download this file. Um, so the interesting thing is, again, the last 20 years, it's been security by shackles, right? Uh, it's like the more shackles you put in there, and it gets in the way of productivity, the more the users are going to go around and do their day jobs. Um, so at the end of the day, if you bubble all of this stuff, AD, blind spot, everything else, organizations are trying to fundamentally balance productivity with risk. That's it. Okay? You've got high risk, and up until now, the products that eliminated the risk created huge amounts of shackles. Um, and so you kind of torn between the two. At the end of the day, all the products that we build from a vendor perspective needs to go into that two buckets. So any product, it's maybe not a silver bullet, but any product that increases, that decreases the risk while simultaneously increasing productivity, that's a win-win. So early this year, uh, we were dealing with a quite interesting hack. And what we realized is that attackers did download it, uh, data and purchase the data almost uh, half of our IT department. Not the company, but the IT department. Uh, when we studied, studied this group, we realized that few other forensic firms are on track of that firm. Um, and the group is quite known. Um, it's out of Asia, operating in the US, including like the most likely the United States type, type of attacks. Now, since one of the third America is uh, already compromised on a social anything, they basically enrich the data, right? So they ultimately knew exactly who is who. And at some point, we got uh, into uh, some of our data that we're processing, and we literally realized that they are measuring the resistance at the organization. Right, so when they have these 40, 50 targets they want to exfiltrate data from, they measure the resistance of internal people. So they look at the office in Chicago, New York, LA, San Francisco, and then they realize that Chicago is the way to go because they have the less technical talent, um, and uh, that's probably the way they can enter into organization, and they make the lateral movement and disappear. It's like if you want to breach anybody in LA, just simply say there were, there's a casting call, we need extras for a movie that's filming next door, and everybody will click on the email. Well, they, they wouldn't even do that. They literally just buy the data. I mean, there's just everyone's data is out there, 
probably for fifteen dollars, uh, one third of the room here, I can buy a social security number too, right? Because you've been breached and they have been exposed and they're dumped somewhere, right? So face the reality, and they know your relatives, they know exactly who you are. Uh, this can turn into you know, some heavy battle. But the one thing component that was very apparent, um, like one of the guys, like when we started what they call the TTPs, uh, of these attackers, like our techniques, tools, and procedures, was that they look at the organization and they look at how they really operate, right? And if they have too many products, that's a great company to attack. Because when you have too many, you can manage effectively almost anything, and you can master it, right? If you have just enough of the products, enough of the talent, and you spend enough on the third-party assessments, you're not a good target. Most likely, you're going to be found as an attacker. So they literally focus on companies that are heavy spenders of a product, have individuals for many years, not updated certifications, uh, don't spend too much money on internal training, but highly technical admins, security admins, people with certification, just, just the technical people who have real access. Right on this computer, they use using Mimikatz. On some of them, they didn't even, even bother to recompile the Mimikatz so it would not be detected by AV. That's how they, while they were and comfortable, the these security professionals would not even detect the Mimikatz dumping AD credential hashes, LSAS, everything out of these systems. And then uh, once they deployed the malware, the uh, original malware, when they got in, they shifted to the code tech, right? Uh, HR page, phenomenal page. Everything authenticated with AD. So when the whole organization with 15,000 users reset the credentials, they got everything back into this. I, th right. I think you're, you're, the challenge to your question is that it's threat specific. If you're worried about malware, there may be some vendors who have great solutions that are out there, but they don't help you with identity. Um, if you're dealing with identity, you might want to enhance two-factor usage uh, throughout your company, but that's not going to help you with malware. So I think the challenge is for a given threat, which is, you know, what are some of the best things you should be doing? Well, let me kind of... F final question that I actually directed to you, Steve. It's based on what, what Kalsik said of the, the challenge and debate between productivity and risk security. Um, what would you say the percentage a focused organization would be spending today is on maintaining governance and compliance and all of that versus innovation? And it, it used to be a lot higher on the innovation, I'm sure, but nowadays, there's a lot going into maintenance. What does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean, to, it, it is clearly shifted in the last several years, as you pointed out. Um, many years ago, it might have been 90% innovation, 10% compliance, and other uh, control partner work. It's probably 75% of the control partner work now and 25% of the innovation work. I, I get very concerned about the profitability of a business when the table stakes to secure the business is so high. That is, if, if a business is going to spend $100 on technology, $75, $75 of that's probably going to control partner work, security organization, infrastructure work, rather than to somebody writing code to help a business make more money. Uh, reminds me of something you told me, Jeremy, in our, our first meeting, which was, why do we spend $50,000 on servers and then $500,000 of perimeter security to put around those servers so we can put them in somebody else's data center? And it's a... Uh, it's pretty much the standard thing is, uh, I, I sit here and I go look at the security product landscape, but I'm sitting there going, we spend so much time saying no, but we're not spending the time saying, how do we make the teams that are developing, provide, providing business value go faster with less complexity? And it always comes down to when it's less complicated, things become easier. But then we have legacy systems. Thus the, the chart Sean had of 2003, 2008, R2, and so on and so forth. Always be here. All right, well, everybody, thank you uh, for your time. And panelists, thank you very much for uh, your guys' you. uh, feedback, guidance, and just awesome. Thank you, thank you.